In the spring of 1882, the quiet life of the community in Crosswick, Ohio, became disrupted when a large bipedal lizard tried to spear it away with one of the young boys of the community. Being described as a reptilian, 30 to 40 feet in length with scaly legs and body, with a head that was large, with deep red eyes and fangs and a mouth, this was the first recorded account of the Crosswick monster. And the topic of tonight's episode with Steve Steglin. More to come after the intro. Welcome, everyone, to the Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities presents the Hometown Haunts podcast. I am your host, Kat Cloco, and along with me in the shadows, of course, like every single week, are Christina Wald and Jen Kohler. We'll be on a little bit later in the show. If you haven't already, please follow us at Sin Cabinet Curio on Twitter, Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities, or sorry, Cincy Cabinet of Curiosities on Instagram. You'd think by nearly 40 episodes, I'd get that right. And if you have a hometown haunt, creepy cryptid, interesting, weird history, or any other little tale from your hometown you'd like to share with us, you can email that to us at hometownhauntedmail at gmail.com. And we're waiting to hear from you. Of course, we're an official podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, and SoundCloud, thanks to Jen. Find us on iTunes at Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities, and please rate and review us there so other spooky lovers and weird history curiosity folks like you can find us. Of course, like always, the link is in the show notes. So before we dive into an interview with Steve, I wanted to introduce all of you wonderful Hometown Haunt podcast listeners to our, I don't want to say redheaded stepchild because I take offense to that particular phase, but this is a little bit of an unknown monster from the Cincinnati area. And this is the Crosswick monster or known as the Crosswick snake. So the sources for tonight's episode are for the are from the Warren County Historical Society, the Cincinnati Inquirer, as always, the Times Gazette, and numerous articles by the Dayton Daily News. It was May of 1882 in the small community of Crosswick or Crosswicks, Ohio, an unincorporated town sitting at the intersection of Bellbrook Road and Old Stage Road, a few miles north of Waynesville, Ohio. Two boys, Ed, 11, and his brother, Joe, 13, Lynch, were fishing along the Middle Run Creek, most likely now known as Statter... Oh my goodness. Hello there, long word. Statterwaith Run, located at the south side of the village. They are interrupted when a large scaly lizard snuck behind them in the grass behind the boys. The large lizard reared up to a height of 14 to 16 feet, hissed, and seized young Ed, taking him away at a gallop, much like a horse. Nearly th- nearby, three men were working at a working quarrying stone, Reverend Jacob Horn, George Peterson, and Alan Jordan. They heard the boys' screams and ran to the incident and pursued the lizard to a hollowed out uh, sycamore tree. There we go, there's a word. Where the lizard dropped Ed. Ed was taken home and treated by a local doctor, Elsie Lincolns from Waynesville. Reportedly, a group of 60 men went after the monster armed with axes, clubs, and dogs and chopped down the sycamore tree, chasing the lizard out. This is where the archived Western Star, Star article from 1882 ends, as well as the Cincinnati Enquirer article from the same year. Uh, however, accounts continue. Becoming alarmed for his safety, the formidable snake leapt from the aperture, threw out its forward hind legs, erected itself about 12 or 14 feet, and with a velocity of a racehorse, crossed the creek and ran up a small hill, climbed over a rail fence, breaking it down and continuing north a mile, followed by pursuers until he reached a hole in a large hill under heavy ledge of rocks according to the western star after the lizard escaped it was reported by the doctor which would be the same one that i talked about earlier lc lunkins to the cincinnati inquirer that ed was in shock but otherwise only had cuts and bruises from the ordeal this however was where the original article ends and the details of oral history take over 
local men decided to blow up the cave, according to more recent articles from the Dayton Daily News. And you can source those from the 1970s, 1980s, twice in the 1990s, and a few times in the aughts. Uh, the pile of, or the cave was also the pile of rocks now located near the Little Miami River, where the lizard had escaped. After the blast, the area was cleared and no large lizard or snake was found there. However, there were sightings afterwards of a similar lizard swimming in Shaker Swamp, located three, located three miles west of Lebanon, Ohio, and then again at Caesar Creek. The crosswick monster, as it has been dubbed, is reportedly 30 to 40 feet long and 16 inches in di diameter with scaled legs and a body. It has fangs and a forked tongue and a long, thin tail, and oral reports say it also has yellow spots along its body. So if you are ever out in that area of Ohio, around Waynesville, Lebanon, or Caesar Creek, let us know if you happen to find the crosswick monster or any of its descendants. We would love to hear from you. You, of course, the listeners, can read about the Crosswick Monster and its gallery of cryptid friends in the upcoming issue of the Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities Comics Anthology. And tonight we have with us Steve Stegelin, who wrote and illustrated a wonderfully humorous take on the Crosswick Monster. A little about Steve. Steve is a long-running editorial cartoonist and illustrator at the Ah, sorry, I'm used to saying Cincinnati. This is Charleston City Paper with awards and recognition from South Carolina Press Association and the Association of Alternative News Media. He is also an indie comic creator, best known for his boondoggle with work published by Night Press, Paragon Entertainment, Morden Comics, Run Riot Media, and Caliber Comics. You can find more about him on his website, stanglin.myportfolio.com or follow him on lots of social media, just like us at Stanglin or on Twitter and Instagram. So welcome, Steve, to the Hometown Haunts podcast. Hey, good to be here. Thanks for Yay. having me. I'm glad uh, the weather didn't blow you away tonight. Yeah, not yet. Hopefully it holds out. Tropical storm, yeah. the shores are crossing, so par for the course. Yeah. So you are from Cincinnati, correct? Yes, I went to high school in Northern Kentucky in Florence um, at Boone County High and then attended college at UC and NKU and graduated from NKU with a psych major that I don't really use. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, but it works really well with doing editorial comics, I would think. It does. Which, mm -hmm. which is my first question because um, I do long form comics, but I've always been fascinated by those of you like you and Kevin who are able to do political editorial cartoons and you just do them in one or two panels. So what is it like? How do you come up with your material? I would imagine it can be very easy, but also what are the differences between working with these mediums? Yeah, totally. Um, I talk cartooning. So I've been with the city paper for 18 years. Um, and yeah, you're right. It can often be, you know, a, a feast of material to work with, or it can be kind of like, what what topic am I going to skewer this week? So Charles and City Paper is a weekly, so it comes every Wednesday. Unlike Kevin, who's at the Inquirer, I think, right? So he's got like a more, more of a regular cadence. Um, and it, yeah, you're right. It is different. The long form stuff, you can take time to kind of nurture the story and kind of develop characters and that kind of thing. The actual cartoons, like you said, are like one, two, actually I do a strip sometimes so it can be up to four panels. But yeah, even then it's like a quick hit in, in and done. Um, it's got a certain cadence to it, like a certain like joke rhythm to it, but there's not, you know, there are recurring characters, but there's no character development, right? So I've got a donkey and elephant that come back routinely to represent the partisan part politics, but you know, they don't really change that much. Um, but it's finding that that humor and that punchline and really with cartoon, editorial cartooning, you know, having an, having obviously an opinion about the topic and having to, uh, taking the reader through a quick little like that of what your opinion is and make them think. And, and really, if I make you laugh or if I make you angry, um, I did my job. But really, if I made you just stop and Think about the subject matter for those matter of seconds then i really kind of accomplished what's up to do yeah and that's what i always find fascinating because with long form you're always writing with this long burn intent 
Like you're trying to entertain somebody throughout, but the short form comics is just, you have to condense everything. And I'm always amazed by people who can write like that. So thank you very much. And definitely yeah, it was, it was fun to do the short for the cabinet curiosities because it was kind of no longer four panels at the most. It was, you know, seven pages and seeing, you know, how I can build on um, panels within the page, but then how the pages can build upon themselves and that kind of thing. And it definitely it was a, a fun change of pace and a good kind of flexing of exercise of muscles I hadn't used for a while. So it was good. Yeah. And that was what made it exciting with you and also Kevin, because I know you both work in the newspaper business in the syndicated business and just seeing you both flex those new, not new, but older muscles yeah. to create really great pieces. Yours is hilarious. Thank I you, love it. Thank you. Uh, and uh, it's actually one of two Crosswick monster stories, but both of you, you know, two different writers had such different interpretations. I wanted to include them both because a lot with this anthology project for our listeners who don't know is taking local artists and writers and having them write their own interpretations of these well-known urban legends. So did you ever hear about the Crosswick monster while you were here in the I had community? Not, no, and that's one reason why I picked it. So you, you know, you just kind of put up here's a, some ideas to to bounce off of, and I read that story and, and I was like, wow, this, I can't believe I'd never heard about this when I lived there in Cincinnati. Um, so yeah, it seemed like it was a fun take. And once I kind of started chewing on that material, you know, I came across the more the humorous take where this this, this cryptid I had never heard of. Obviously, from his perspective, he's probably worldwide famous. And, you know, so I made him more of a narcissist and that kind of thing. So, yeah. That worked really well. I liked that. Yeah. And you also incorporate other popular urban legend creepy cryptids from around the, not just Cincinnati, but the larger Ohio, Ohio area. And we have quite a few. So I love I love the Loveland Frogman. You also have the Ohio Grassman. And then you have the Devil Monkey and, of course, Mothman. Yes. so yeah totally it was you know, like i said i spent a lot of time in cincinnati lived there for a number of years really kind of call you know part of that home and and it really is a good chance to kind of give a love letter back to uh my cincinnati haunts and you know throw through in the serpentine wall and you know that kind of thing just to kind of shout out to everything i kind of miss about the cincinnati area mm-hmm. um so since you're from mostly northern kentucky Yep. Were there any particular ghost stories or urban legends around where you grew up that you knew of? So the, was it the Bobby Mackey, like the bar there, totally, mm-hmm. you know, t- tons of great stories about that being haunted. Um, and yeah, I mean, their music hall, right, had tons of, in Cincinnati, had, you know, a lot of great stories about it. So, but yeah, I remember the Bobby Mackey one in particular, you know, I was in college at UC and we we did a like a road trip one night to come back into North Kentucky and check out the bar and see what haunts we encountered. We unfortunately came up dry, but um, you know, I hear there's still is it is it still open? Is the bar? It is open? still open. Oh. Um, I'm not sure how COVID would have affected it, but I know I was there only a few years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's still open, and I know Bobby Mackey was just in the news talking about it, so. Um, Someday we'll do an episode on it, I'm sure, for this podcast, but it's so done, um, yeah. overdone. Yeah, totally. that I, I like highlighting the other places like the witch's tree or yeah. um, the crematorium that it's not, Buffalo Ridge or other, or Helltown, like all those fun things. So uh, The witch's tree is interesting because I remember that I went to NKU and that was near there, right? So yeah, heard stories about the witch's tree um and I, that was on the list as well did anybody do the witch's tree for the no home? one has oh, done it so it will be in reserve for book three nice yeah and oh. i like it i think it's a wonderful just take on witches here in the midwest before like when cincinnati was just a small town and it, it actually that area of kentucky wasn't even part of the metro yeah. area oh. so yeah um how did you learn about the Cincinnati Cabinet of Curiosities project? That's a good question. I think it was Facebook. So I am friends with Kevin on Facebook as well as Tim. Um, 
and I believe one of those, may, the one of them may have actually kind of posted about it, shared about it, um, their initial Kickstarter um, for volume one. So I actually ended up, you know, supporting the first one and was real excited to kind of get this kind of snapshot of, you know, the local talent there all in one nice little anthology. And then when I saw, so I think I followed the, the, the page for the anthology on Facebook and then saw, or maybe through Kickstarter, got the notification about the second volume. So I was all over it when I saw this mission go up. Yes, thank you for supporting us last year. Now, like I said, it was great. And I went, I guess 2019 before the world shut down, I was up in Columbus for CXC and I did oh, yeah. you know, got to meet Tim in person and Kevin in person for the first time um, after being a fan of Tim's work for years um, through like his original indie days and critters, that kind of thing. And then coming across Kevin just through actual cartooning circles. Um, and so again, to meet them in person was great. And then just kind of meeting this collective of Cincinnati comic creators that, you know, I, often, I looked at the time, I was like, you know, if I had never left Cincinnati, these are the people I might be hanging out with, you know, <laughs> then. So it's like my alt my alt reality friends. So it was kind of good to kind of meet them all. And again, to have this little snapshot of this anthology that featured so many of them was fantastic. Yes. And I'm sure when we can all meet again at CXC, we yes. can all hang out and that'd be wonderful. Cool. Um, yeah. It, and also just as a note, you had a more traditional way, cause we have a lot of comic creators that do listen to this podcast. Um, you did a more traditional ink on paper for your submission, correct? I did. So I work old school, uh, Bristol board, pencil, ink and pen. Um, yeah, I just, I've always done that. When I was in the Cincinnati area, um, I did an indie comic called Boondoggle. Um, so I started off as campus comic strip at UC that then I took with me to NKU. Um, and then I graduated uh, NKU, uh, had actually won like a statewide college paper award from the, the comic strip uh, when I Ooh, left. Wow. Was trying to figure out what to do with the, the characters. And at that time, uh, Jeff Smith was doing really well with Bone. And I knew he had done that as an editor cartoon in Columbus. So I kind of thought, well, I'll, I'll try to follow in his footsteps some and did Boondoggle. And I just have always done pen and, pen and ink on Bristol board since then. And even the cartoons today for the C paper, um, same thing. So yeah, very old school. No, I liked it though. It it Thank was you. it was great reading through everyone's submissions and they were all in different ways, but yeah. yeah. I liked yours. I, well, I love the camera angles, the choices, like the word balloon choices. It was all great. And everyone will be able to read it in October when or yeah, if you get the digital version. So Christina and Jen, would you like to come join us? Hey. Hey. Hello. Hey. So <laughs> I, yeah, I always always struggle with that. Like, should I do something traditionally? It just takes less time now for me to ink it digitally because um, then I don't have to scan it in. Plus, you know, it seems like when I'm working at my desk these days, I have to fight with the new cats to work on my. So I've actually been doing more digital than usual because um, they kind of wreck one's producti productivity when they're standing like on your artwork. <laughs> uh, no yeah, they, do. they don't understand they don't understand well they do understand what am i saying they understand perfectly exactly. they just want to be a part just, of yes. the project That's and right. just yes. wipe your ink all over <laughs> yes or or trod through the palettes or whatever mm -hmm. um you know it's just more expedient so kudos to you i think you hand lettered as well I did everything by hand except for the coloring, which I did. So it's not, it's all black and white, but I did do some grayscale through some flashback sequences essentially. So I kind of did those and a kind of a sheen of the gray again to kind of as a cross book kind of narrates his own story. I wanted mm -hmm. to have it as like embellished as I could. So I thought I would kind of do some contrast there between the stark black and white of the mm -hmm. cryptids and then his gray tone black, you know, flashback. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a brilliant um, tableau of, you know, seeing the personalities of all the different cryptids and that sort of thing. I think people are going to love it. I'd love to see it animated, actually. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. It needs, it needs to be like an extra, like a short on a Rick and Morty or something. Nice. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that would work really <laughs> well. Yeah. It would. It would. Um, so did the, cross, the crossbook monster eat the kids? 
It just like to take them. It, it, the (laughs) story, it, it took Ed away and he was in such shock. He was in shock for a few days, according to the doctor. And, um, he had a couple of bruises and scratches, but otherwise was fine. And according to a Dayton, Dayton daily news articles from around the seventies, it said that he lived a long life, kind of quiet, shy, but they always are. Yeah. Yeah. So I liked how the story got more embellished as time went on too. Like originally it just ended with the, uh, snake being chased away into a cave and they waited for it to come out and never came out so people just left but Mm -hmm. as time went on we got this little addendum where it they detonated the cave with dynamite it they thought they killed it that way because they couldn't fathom as an escape tunnel and when they searched the cave and the rubble uh rubble there was no corpse so and then just like a few years later, they were seeing a, a monster that fit its description in Lebanon and in Caesar Creek. So wow. it lives on. Of course. Well, you know, it, it seems like there is like whenever you have these sorts of, I'm going to say abduction, like it's always like children get abducted. You know, I mean, is this part of those types of urban legends, do you think? Like a boogeyman? Yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. It, it's kind of all these cryptids that seems to be culturally uh, what they are based at. Just putting my little mm-hmm. anthropology hat on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's you're wanting to protect your kids from walking off and getting hurt um, and making sure like they don't get too close to a river's edge so they don't drown or um, or get I mean, around the water's edges here, we have water moccasins. So you don't want them being bitten by those because at the time in 1882, that wasn't a guaranteed thing you're going to live through, um, especially being young. So you have boogeyman like La Llorona is another famous boogeyman type entity. Now she's seen as a ghost, but also that's a warning of stay away from the water's edges because you may get taken in and drowned by her. And, uh, Oh, it was it Kelpies are too, are like that. Kappa in Japanese mythology, exact same type of thing. A water entity that will take you out mm-hmm. in and drown you to eat your liver. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, all sorts of delicious human parts. That sounded wrong. Anyway, um, well, also used later. by mothers and parents and grandparents for years and years and years to get their kids to go to bed and to behave. Yeah. Yeah. that's where the grass man fear. is yeah mm-hmm. haunting mm-hmm. the forests around you um mm-hmm. you have the ohio grass man mm-hmm. or yeah. the m- melon heads if you're from cleveland or parts of canada mm-hmm. or parts of michigan um so yeah these a lot of these cryptids are just extensions of just folklore with a purpose basically and uh, mm-hmm. that's why i love different interpretations of them because they are meant to be interpreted in different ways mm-hmm. uh, also talking Which, about this with Mike ahead, like before the show, um, he was just like, maybe it was an escaped alligator from like a circus. And I'm like, that could be like, maybe, maybe they didn't know what an alligator looked like. Cause it fits the description almost. Yeah. Is yeah. that like the, the, the famous urban legend in New York city where somebody thought it was a cat and it was actually a giant rat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or alligators in the sewer system type of thing. Yeah, yeah. There's all sorts of stories kind of like that. Which was your favorite cryptid to draw in the comic? Um, you know, everyone was the funnest when I was drawing them. They were, each was my favorite at the time. I will say, looking back, the expressions on Loveland Frog. I just I, he doesn't say a whole lot, but I love the expressions he, he manages with just a few lines. So yeah, I was really happy with how he turned out. Hmm. Yeah, people oh, yeah. love drawing Frogman. Like, you know, whenever we have anything that, I mean, people love to draw cryptids in general. No, totally. And, you know, when you give people a choice, do you want to draw a haunted house or Frogman? Frogman always wins, you know. Cool. Um, <laughs> and it seems like the you know, stories are extremely tenuous behind them. Um, is there any other like cryptids around the country that are frog like, or are we unique to have our Frogman? 
So, oh. uh, are there frogs? I, I was gonna say I know there's a lizard. There's a lizard man here in South Carolina that. Ooh. Oh, is What's there? That yes, story? Are there any? Yeah, yeah. What are the cryptids around you? Um. So the 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 lizard man escape or swamp um is more upstate, but definitely very similar to you know the crossbook. He's a giant lizard creature. Um, and there is if you Google it, there is this is only a few years ago. There was like a resurgence of him. But it's a pretty cheesy costume that you see this may walking around in. So that was that was pretty funny. He was back in news for that. There is, while I think about the storm outside, um, the gray man, which is sort of like, you know, they said the Mothman was like this trying to caution and, and warn about the Silver Bridge collapse. Um, there's the gray man who has seen as a ghost along the shoreline uh, during hurricane season. And you know, he kind of portends a, a, a storm coming off the shore um, and how bad it's going to be. So, oh, wow. Yeah. And there are tons of oh. ghost stories about Charleston. Charleston is a lot of history to it and you know, a lot of historical sites. Um, there's the old prison down, the old jail downtown. Uh, Livonia Fisher is like, you know, reported to be a ghost there who was. Uh, when she was alive, uh, before she was imprisoned, the rumor is, story is that she would basically had a boarding house of sorts that she would kind of lure travelers into um, and then basically poison their meal so they would go to bed Whoa. and kind of rust it off. Um, and while they were in bed rusting off the, the illness, there's a trap door apparently under the bed. So she would, you know, trap them in this dungeon area and then steal other blinds. And then, you know, they're down there to die and their bed's open for the next person. So she has reportedly haunts the old prison. Um, and there are lots of great uh, graveyards as well. So there are stories about like a well-to-do, a girl from well-to-do family who, who literally fr- like died of fear and fright, like in the grave, like she was visiting um, the site of either a friend or a relative and he was you know trapped by a ghost and, and died there in the graveyard so whoa oh wow lots of good stories here in charleston yeah, yeah it's we one of those places savannah. yeah like savannah definitely yeah, and it had all you know lots of ghost type type things you yeah. know i think it's the south the south has a lot of ghosts yes that's true you know but that's yeah. that's interesting um, yeah it is but no other frogs I know, at least not here in this area. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think through other cryptid tales about any fro- other frogmen. I'm yeah, not I haven't sure. heard any either. There's, there's, there's like a few. Yeah, there's, there's a few. Um, I, I just, let's see, just a little bit of a jan- tangent. Oh, frogman. Cryptid. Yeah, like in the first comic, when I did Satan's Hollow, it turns out there's lots of cities that have satanic dreams. Apparently, it must be an epidemic in the country, you know. <laughs> and, and I think it's because there's something about hidden tunnels that seems nefarious. Oh, totally. You know, it's sort of like the underworld. Uh, I think we talked about it before. Sort of, if you've ever read Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere, you know, this yep. sort of under London is, but you know, the, the secret. And I think that's what people see when they get these tunnels and when you're a kid you know you you fit in those tunnels better than you do at our age but you know it's like a secret place you can escape your parents and it's it's ripe for lore and you always want to scare your friends and that sort of thing no totally and probably similar with the cryptid didn't somebody do some really cheesy footage of the frogman at just a couple of years ago was it 2013 or so or tw- oh yeah they, it was um oh man it was it was very inconvincing 16 yeah uh tim used it for his um profile picture he he i think photoshopped it into his background That's last awesome. year yeah uh, i'm just looking up lizard men and frogmen reptilian humanoids that's that's no. the that's what you're looking for but let's see um there's folklore there's a lot to the point where i can't easily just access everything like (laughs) right now cool though doctor who does kind of show up as one of his first search engines so (laughs) yeah 
Yeah, there's a lot. Oh my goodness. But there are popular, popular. Um, let's see, just a few. Uh, there's one from Portugal. Um, there's the Kappa, as I mentioned earlier, the Lizard Man Escape or Swamp, Loveland Frogman, uh, Thetis Lake Monster in Canada, the White Snake in Chinese folklore, and the Kuka, which is, or Koka, is an alligator humanoid from Brazilian folklore. Wow. So those are just some of them. And of course, if you're really into aliens and those conspiracies, there are also the lizard people walking among us. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or a Doctor Who fan. I think that was in that too. Yes. <laughs> do, do you ever, um, I mean, is drawing this sort of like paranormal stuff, is this something you'd ever done before? Is that something that was new for you? Or have you done like that type of story in the past? So definitely, I draw monsters every week for the city paper. The politicians I draw are kind of monsters. <laughs> yes, um, yes. But you know, I definitely, I, I've always loved the paranormal and supernatural stuff. And there is another project I, I work with called Monster Atlas. And basically, they go through um, around the world and basically kind of take a subset. And you know, here's a lot of Eastern European monsters and that kind of thing. So I'm going through actually right now and working on a bunch of illustrations for that from Baba Yaga to Vlad the Impaler and that kind of thing. So, Oh, oh that fun. sounds really fun. Yeah. Mm. I always like Baba, Baba Yaga. Yaga. I do too. I think it's her house with the chicken feet I like. Yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. That's, that's pretty great. Yeah. I know. I mean, it, it, it makes the tiny home movement like a whole new light. I mean, it totally does. You could, I know. I, I think more people would get tiny homes if they had chicken feet. <laughs> That's it just kind of reminds moment. me of the mushroom house that's here in East Hyde Park. So, oh, yes, yes. Yeah. I'm sure that Steve knows about that. Maybe. Um, when you went to um, when you went to UC, were you in DAP or? I was in DAP. Yeah, totally. I did a graphic design there for a couple of years. Um, drew a thermos for an entire semester and got a little burnout. So that's why I ended up a psych major. So there you go. I was really mm-hmm. willing to give you an illustration, but at the time they didn't offer that. So they could go into fine arts or something else so i went into something else so there you go mm-hmm. well it's funny i teach illustration at nku so well, but they don't have it as a major uh, um got, and yeah. it, you know uh and, and i always have thought that design should be coupled with illustration as a major because i don't think you can have one without the other um but you know they're gradually like for example i'm teaching advanced digital painting now so um they're gradually adding more stuff and animation and that kind of thing i mean illustration seems to have a weird it seems not to be at a lot of colleges like it's more at art schools which is weird because they don't really respect illustration so exactly it's so it's it's, it's, yeah it's something that they have i think because kids want it but most you know art establishments don't like it for some reason and i don't know why yeah, I think it's our love of drawing dragons, perhaps. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, I, I, I think know. that's what turns people off. Nice. Well, my mom is part of the old school um, fine arts movement who worked in the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And when I was interested in doing comics for a living, and mind you, I was a high schooler. So, you know, how much do you know about what you want to do when you're that age? But hey, look, I'm still a cartoonist. But anyway, um, she her perspective of it was you won't make any money as an illustrator or a cartoonist so why would you go to school for that and that seemed to be the same type of attitude the teachers at uh, my university also had in the fine arts like you do fine arts and you go home makes lots of money (laughs) that's the kind of thing that's that's kind of funny totally yeah it's it's all in the commercial aspect like we all do stuff that people consume very quickly, but they appreciate what they're consuming, the content they're consuming, and they continue on supporting us because of it. I mean, this podcast is also a lot like that too. So, Well, not to mention every corporation uses illustration. Oh Oh, yeah. Yeah. For their advertising. So I, that may, mm. yeah. Well, now they have those majors. Yeah. Like, like that's what my mom did but you're looking at the 1960s and that was a new major back when she did that and i know with cartoon and cartoon theory there's only like you can a handful of schools that will teach you that how to be a cartoonist Mm -hmm. i mean 
think there's like well, I think, three. I think one of the problems in academic things, and we really have gone on a tangent here, is that mm. a lot of people do not do academic papers about cartooning or about, I mean, there are people starting to, like mm. most people will write yet another paper about abstract expressionism or whatever. I mean, when you're doing a thesis, you have to get someone that's going to, I mean, I'm not an expert of these things, but you have to get someone that's going to actually, you know, help you with your you know, whatever your dissertation is going to be. And Mm -hmm. there have been some forces trying to get, I mean, the Billy Ireland Museum, which we were talking about before we got in the air, is is a great example of this. They're a library for people to write academic papers about cartooning. And to me, cartooning, like political cartoons, like what you do, um, and, you know, even your peanut strips or stuff that was in the paper, to me, show are the, are, are, contemporary art that's much more relevant and says a lot more about society than anything that you see in a museum that's contemporary art to me yeah any contemporary art particularly that's created now if it's like in a contemporary art museum it's been you know financed by some crazy billionaire and is almost worthless artwork you know but somebody has paid a lot of money for it and what it wants it to be worth more and so it's in a you know institution I mean, this is yeah. true. I mean, everybody's kind of nodding their head. <laughs> Whereas, I mean, we're looking um, at NFTs doing the same thing yeah, right now. Exactly, exactly. Well, yeah. uh, you know, one of Kuhn's big backers is, uh, it's not, it's spelled broad, but I think it's pronounced broad. Uh, he's, he's, he gave the endowment to the, I think the LA uh, Museum of Modern Art. And so he mm-hmm. buys a lot of Kuhn's stuff. And, and that's why his work is worth ridiculous amounts of money. Yet, mm. to me, the stuff you see in indie comics, um, you know, some of the stuff that, you know, all the stuff in political cartooning um, and, and graphic novels, you know, a lot of the revolutions in, in graphic novels now that the kids are reading to me is the most vital and interesting contemporary art coming out. I mean, if you read Alison Bechtel's stuff about her growing up. Yep. Um, yeah, but even, you know, any comic, you know, Marvel and DC comics, how much of our culture is influenced by people reading DC comics and Marvel D- comics. And now that's most of our pop culture. Totally. And, you know, as an anthropologist, um, you know, these are our gods and goddesses that they used to talk about. Like, you know what I mean? It's like all yeah, of those stories retold in, you know, a different form. There yeah. was an academic paper that was written, I think in the early nineties talking about DC, a de- definitely superman as a representation of god i remember having to read it for one of my classes but as a contemporary cultural anthropologist and i know i've sat and listened to um, talks from the billy ireland about manga history because they have a rather large Mm -hmm. manga um, collection there it's largest outside of japan one of them there's a contention with a different university library is there a contention oh there is there they claim i know they claim but there i forget which other university has a very Ooh. large manga cage library match. but yeah um <laughs> academic cage match anyway well, that um, people would be interested in yeah maybe yeah. um so yeah it, it's like with our cicada episode uh what i did it, we used kevin's editorial cartoons from that but a great way of looking through history and how everyone in different generations treated cicadas and it was easy to track it by the editorial cartoons they created at the time and just seeing how they reacted from 1868 where they were like right now we're like he got to embrace the cicada you got to love the cicada it fertilizes the world the cicada and then you go 17 years later and they're like kill all the cicadas they're terrible things burn them all it's like all those spider memes when they get in the house it's like burn (laughs) your orchards don't eat apples don't eat squirrel pie like the why are you eating squirrel pie but we talked about it in the episode like two weeks ago um but just squirrel pie we did talk about squirrel pie um go check it out it was interesting anyhow um it was weird like everything on this podcast uh but it's a great way of putting your pulse on the culture at the time they're little time capsules so that's that 
That's why I always appreciate editorial cartooning. And now I am done. Like, um, you know, cartooning in a visceral way has documented history uh, a lot better than, say, what you see in contemporary arts collections. Because, you know, they may describe that it shows these things. But, like, if you read Marvel comics in the 70s and 60s, they really covered, you know, civil rights stuff and did stories about it before a lot of other things were. You know, like, they've really been you know, part of the big picture um, and totally ignored. And and so while they were doing stories about, you know, stuff that's going on in America, you know, current American culture, um, you know, people that write about art and stuff would ignore it and call it trash, which I, I suppose is an honor because, you know, anything that's in the establishment isn't going, it's always going to be the underground stuff, which, you know, even though Barbell has a huge appeal, it has, would you call it outsider art sort of thing, you know, uh, and so it's not considered legitimate. So most people that went to college in the 70s and 60s, if they wanted to do comics, they were told they were doing trash. And how dare you even think about doing that for a living? Because it's not that you wouldn't make money, but it's garbage. You don't want to be working on that. And when then that we circle back to my had. mom harping at me when I was 14. Anyway, so yeah. your, <laughs> well, your, this goes back to the parents. So we could do we could do an app episode on stuff our parents told us not to do. Don't do comics. Don't <sighs> everything yeah. your parents told you not to do. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I like being able to talk about comics and how they impact culturally. We don't get to talk about too much on this show. Just and ironically, it's what we all do for a living. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, Christina, you're right. I mean, comics are a great kind of time capsule of the events of the day, be it Marvel comics, be it local cartoons, obviously are very targeted on, you know, the, the event of the week or the day. Um, you mentioned Billy Ireland Museum, and they've got, you know, the Walt Kelly Fogo exhibit going on right now. And Walt Kelly mm-hmm. was great about kind of diving into the politics of the time and presenting it in, you know, a way that I've been I've been told my art style is very deceptively cute. And I think Walt Clay is the same sort of thing where, you know, it looks very endearing and charming to look at. But once you start reading it and the humor is so pointed and sharp, it is like kind of you got stabbed in the back all of a sudden. You didn't even realize it's kind of up on you. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I Those are the comics that always resonate with me are the ones that have a message and are have an opinion in the commentary, even if it's not on the face a parent right so mm-hmm. exactly yeah we would do that so mm-hmm. on that note because our time is dwindling down oh, steve yeah, can you share them. where everyone can follow you so they can read all your delightful political commentary well thank you yes um so you mentioned social media so instagram i post everything on there i'm at steglin on instagram um same handle on twitter um and then also the charleston city paper.com um, post my stuff there. You can see that in real time every Wednesday. Um, there's a political cartoon. If you go to the menu and select opinion, Stuglin, you get all archive all, all my stuff. And I also do a fun feature for them. They do a police blotter where they go through and find funny anecdotes from the police files for the week. Um, so I draw an illustration for that every week as well. So if you go to news blotter, you can see me drawing uh, drunks and petty criminals from the Charleston area. So there you go. Oh, that's fun. Oh, thank you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Jen, we need to do that for around here. Yeah. That'd be great. (laughs) Yeah. So for us, um, you can follow us at Sin Cabinet Curio on Twitter, Sin C C Cabinet of Curiosities on Instagram. And of course, you could send us your own hometown haunt at hometownhauntedmail at gmail.com. Dear viewer and listener, every week we grab a piece of mail from our hometown haunted mailbag and read it on air for you to enjoy. This is a listener submitted story. Jen, take it away. Okay, this is from Mike. Mike says, when I was three to four years old, we lived in a small town in Indiana, Newcastle, not too far from here. It was a very old house. At night, I would routinely see apparitions and shadow figures creeping around my bedroom. One night, I was awoken to a brilliant light in the hallway outside my door. In the light was a figure I couldn't make out. It raised its arm towards me and said, come here, come here. 
I freaked out, ran around. <laughs> I freaked out, ran around in circles and ducked under the bed. And that is where my mom found me the next morning. There must have been something about me that these entities sought, sought me out for. But since age 10, when we, were mo- when we moved here, I have not experienced anything else, giving credence to the notion that young kids are open to that realm. Wow. If a ghost tells you to come here, come here. No, you don't follow it. Yeah, you don't follow calling ghosts. You never do that. No, no. Now, if a guide dog comes up to you and is motioning, come here, come here, follow the guide dog, because if it's a service animal, somebody is in need. All right. That's a good story. Thank you for <laughs> submitting it. Very creepy. Yeah. Very creepy. I love it. So thank you for submitting this story. And as always, if you have a story to submit, you can submit it to hometownhauntedmail at gmail.com. And also, you can follow us at Sin Cabinet Curio on Twitter, at Cincy Cabinet of Curiosities on Instagram. And I'm Kat. There's Christina. That's Jen over there. And stay safe and stay curious. Good night. Night. Peace.